Simon Upset from Psycho Police in Denver, Aaron Reed. I wonder what the panel thoughts. Um, are we in danger of uh, just engaging with with the uh, affluent and worried well? <laughs> no, I am the worried well. <laughs> I have a season ticket at my doctor's. So who would like to start? Uh, I feel we really ought to start with Caroline. Yeah, I'll go for that one. I think in a way that was what I was trying to do. I need a mic. So I believe so. I'll pass it along to anyone who's speaking. So yes, I think in a way what I was trying to say is you need um, the affluent and worried well might naturally uh, respond to you, your usual sort of marketing campaigns or whatever you do to put out the message of walking and the uh, nat natural environment is good for you. And they, because that's how they do respond, that's been the same with giving up smoking or drinking and so on, that you get a much better response from those who are already kind of halfway there. Um, but to <coughs> engage with the, the so-called hard to reach, uh, you need a kind of intermediary thing. And that's what I was saying about the experience of Dandelion Times, it needs to be near to the individual where they live uh, and, and available to them. And that intermediary, process is a, is a reconnection process and I think that's where we need to be putting our energies in then I think people are capable of anything once they're empowered and it doesn't matter what their background is but they need that support that encouragement empowerment confidence and understanding of why it's beneficial and then then I think but, uh, but it would be a mistake to say you know here's our AONB AONB come to us and that's all we have to do. And we've got to go out there into the communities and get people understanding why this is beneficial and green our communities as well. Anyone else like a go? Um, I think, yeah, I think the answer is yes. Um, this is something we were talking about uh, in, the, in the break. Um, and Natural England's, uh, remind me again of the acronym, MENI survey stands for yeah, so Natural England's uh, Monitoring Engagement the Natural Environment Survey shows that um, there is a clear distinction between uh, essentially the, in a broad generalisation, the middle classes and the working classes in terms of their uh, engagement with the natural environment and that the middle classes have a, uh, I can't remember what they call it, but an enjoyable uh, relationship with the natural environment, whereas the working classes to a certain extent have a functional relationship with the natural environment, i.e. it's somewhere they walk their dog or somewhere they walk across to get somewhere else. Um, and I think, uh, and, and when there is such a clear link in mental health between deprivation mental health issues, then that is something that we need to address. And I think I, I'd agree with what Caroline said about some of this is about access in, in places where um, these individuals are. But some of this we were talking about is the, is the transformational power of taking people from an urban environment into the natural environment, into, into your areas of outstanding natural beauty. So um, absolutely, I think in, in anything that we do, certainly in, in mental health, um, we do, uh, whether it's about the natural environment or not, we do create opportunities which are um, always accessed in some, sorry not always, but are often accessed in some senses by those who are least needing those services and who are best able, which is not necessarily um, the, the, the right people. Don't feel you have to, by the way, if you don't feel it's your area of expertise, but if you wish to, obviously. I, I'd like to say something. Um, um, I think tranquility, the subject, is a leveller. It's something that you don't need to be educated in necessarily. It's something you don't need to be able to necessarily buy. And I think it's a great leveller. So therefore, in terms of a tranquility type project, no, I don't think it does target one than the other. It's the breadth of getting people engaged that also allows access into those views. Um, yeah, I'd like to add that um, there, there are, you know, obviously pockets of deprivation everywhere, and certainly in the Y Valley AOMB area and the Forest of Dean, there are there are um, a number of areas that are quite deprived. Um, so through working in partnership with organisations like the Arts, um, who are engaging with the harder to reach audiences that that you might wish to to, to draw into the landscape. 
Um, you know, it's a really, a really good way of, of, of meeting um, and working with, with people that might not ordinarily um, engage. Mm. Yeah, I'll just really, really quickly add to that, which is, which is that the, um, is a very similar uh, question that we constantly uh, need to continue to, to address in the arts as well. That actually, you know, that the, uh, the, the that uh, a lot more of the arts uh, is attended by more affluent uh, members of the community. So, you know, we are doing very similar work around uh, how we tackle that. You know, things like putting on coaches of working with schools, putting on coaches, uh, um, taking artists into the schools. You know, it's a very simple thing. I'm sure it's sort of work that you do, and, and, and many of you do. <coughs> Uh, and, and actually paying for those, getting funding to pay for those coaches to take them out into the community. And then we have seen them coming back the, uh, at the weekend with their families because they, 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 they have some buy-in, as it were, to put it quite crudely in, in, in a way. Those, the, the children are working with the artists, they're creating work, they're taking it home, they're coming out into the, into the community. But it, it, it's, it, there's a lot more work to be done, I have to, I have to say. It's, it, it, it's really important because we do, you know, we, uh, um, there's less work to be done work bringing uh, uh, people who feel more naturally you know that, that it's their, their space so yeah okay, thank you good start Simon Lucy um, it's a two-part question can you just can you open the microphone or I'll have to repeat it oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah I'm Lucy Lauren from Outside and Silvdale AOMB and I've got a two-part question about the Dandelion project thank you for telling us about it um, but I was particularly interested to understand how the referral um, process works um, and how that project works with um, the health practitioners and also what facilities, what, what your site is like, what, what facilities you, you have on site to make it work really well. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I won't go into a huge amount of detail, conscious of there may be other questions, so I can talk to you afterwards in a bit more detail if you like. But um, in terms of the referral, it's either education, social care, or um, uh, CAMS, the Children and Adolescent Mental Health uh, medical side of things. And some referrals are direct from word of mouth as well, but a minority. And then we, we fund ourselves quite a lot of the work, but we do get a small amount of funding from statutory agencies as well. In terms of what facilities we have, um, we're on a farm environment and we have our farmhouse, um, and we have some fields and some woodland, uh, and a vegetable garden, and various animals, sheep, um, chickens, um, pigs, uh, donkeys, hamsters, and uh, guinea pigs, and uh, cats and dogs, because we, we find, the, you know, just as you were saying about tranquility, if you could speak up. Sorry, sorry, can you hear me now? You're saying about tranquility is individual, well, so is how children relate to the natural environment. It's very individual. So what we find is that a range of opportunities, the child will respond to something, and it's a, it is an engagement exercise. And we do go to the home first, actually. We bring, we bring and the, you know, they do engage naturally. Children haven't lost that natural relationship with the natural environment that some of the adults have. They have to relearn it. Hannah, is there a referrals element to your project, or is, is the engagement that you have through engaging with particular groups of people who are suffering from this dementia? And the project's open to, to anyone that wants to self self refer, but we found that, um, that actually there there aren't there aren't many quality projects around for people with dementia and their carers. So we we really have we've had a waiting list from the beginning. And um, organisations like Carers Gloucestershire and the Alzheimer's Society um, have signposted people to us um, continuously. Um, so yeah, it's, it's handy in that when a referral comes via an organisation like that, that you do have that extra support then if, if, um, if it's needed. Um, but yeah, um, people can come along via word of mouth and, and, and join in. But for people that want to run similar projects, then obviously linking in with organisations that are specialists in, in whatever field, um, we found that people are just delighted to have something quality to refer onto. Thank you. Next. 
Um, Helen, and then Paul and Jane. Um, hi, I'm Helen Noble. I'm on um, prospects to look after the heritage of the South Pennines. Right, can you hear me? Yes. Um, physician Hill, myself, I think is a good advantage to use. Um, and probably the National Health Service is probably the most stressful places to work. And I'm just wondering whether the panel have any sort of ideas and supports um, that we can look at inwardly, perhaps, on how we look after our own health and well-being in our workplaces because I think you know we, we're putting out massive projects and programs out there we're looking after our audiences we're looking after our partners and things but I wonder whether there's suggestions that we can bring it in-house a little bit and see how we can perhaps put into our work programs a, a little bit more I agree. I would like some advice on that too. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all would. So. <laughs> Who's lost the microphone back? Thanks. Um, I'm really glad you asked that actually because um, we've had as part of the Five Year Forward View a big focus on staff health and wellbeing and that's already started. So in NHS England we've had a big programme of training called Health at Work. And the evidence shows that you, um, it's, an, it's, an, it's a voluntary agency organisation called Health at Work that deliver the training. Uh, the evidence shows that you need senior people in any organisation not only to understand it, but to practice the, the, what they preach. So the sort of emails going out at, at, at you know, 11 o'clock on a Friday evening are not health producing um, from a senior manager and they don't lead to tranquility and well-being over your weekend. So, um, you know, especially if there's a deadline for Sunday morning to apply. And um, so, so all that kind of behavior that's inherent, and obviously it is very stressful on the wards and in the A&E, and, and you know, as a GP, they're having huge stress problems. The GPs are all absolutely exhausted. So what we're trying to do is look at how that can be relieved. So the stress has got to come off but also lifestyle issues such as getting your exercise, eating well. If we have conferences and events, somebody, somebody confessed to me this morning that there were biscuits around there and I might not approve of that. So we're now, we're now not having nice, uh, delicious cakes and biscuits at our events. We're having the fruit and the vegetables and we're trying to make them look attractive and inviting as well. Um, I recognize that's a bit miserable. But if we, can't, you know, if we can't do it, how can we expect the rest of the population? I think that's, that's the thing, you know, if we're all going to be, so it's, uh, and we're all going to, well, I've got my phone on me um, that's measuring all my steps, we're all having to report on our steps every week and so on, and trying to be more active, taking breaks, and the evidence shows you're more effective in your role if you do that, so um, it, it's, it's beneficial to the work outcomes as well as to individuals' health and well-being. And there's less sickness, very good as well. So it's worth, worth doing. So please no tweet senior health executive said fruit's not very interesting or exciting. <laughs> 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 Just the power of the danger of social media. Don't, <laughs> don't, 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 don't say that. <laughs> um, anyone else? <laughs> Uh, just to mention a, a couple of things from a mental health perspective. So, uh, Mind launched a campaign you may have seen. We, we launched our, our big new campaign at the beginning of June, which is about uh, mental health within primary care. Um, because 80% of people will, uh, their mental health problems will be addressed in primary care and they'll never move into any, uh, any other form. So, it, there's, a, there's a big issue, and essentially, primary care is failing uh, people with a mental health issue. However, having said that, you can't address the issues in primary care for people with mental health problems if you don't address the mental health issues of the staff in primary yeah. care. Um, and uh, we have to be very careful at this point launching a campaign which is in some ways criticising primary care when we know that those staff, you know, we're talking about those, those doctors and those junior doctors, uh, are doing an amazing job and, and if they're failing, they're failing because of the system, not because of themselves. So just a couple of things, so mine will be launching a, a campaign about the mental health of, of primary care workers. Um, I wish I could remember when it is, but it's certainly within the next year. Um, and we'll focus really much, very much on, on you know, these are, these are vital people and, and their, their mental health is important. I'd also point people always to the resources that our, our campaign Time to Change has. So it's an it's a anti-stigma campaign that we run with uh, Rethink Mental Health, Mental Illness. Um, 
and, uh, and, and there's a huge amount there on workplace well-being. And then the other thing I would always mention is that the NHS as a landowner is, is one of the, is a huge land, you know, owns a huge amount of green space. Um, and, and we've seen today how important green space is. So, uh, you know, staff within the NHS should, should be making use of that green space and getting out into it. Um, anyone else? So no. <laughs> well, no, no. I mean, it, it, it is interesting because a lot of us, you know, we were a dance. We, we are. We develop dance and and do a lot of work around health and well-being. And yet, sort of, I'm acutely aware that I spend most of my day sat in front of a, a laptop, actually, you know. Uh, and um, but I have to say, in terms of you know, uh, empowering the work team, you know, we have flexible work hours, you know, people feel very engaged in their work and, uh, and uh, in control of their work in, in some ways, but I also have to say we have more work to be done as an industry, I'm talking about the arts, in terms of are we working, I mean, yeah, long, long hours, we might be, you know, I might be up seeing a show in London up until, you know, back home at one o'clock in the morning and then up again, and <coughs> doing whatever somebody just said of emails going out at, terrible hours, and I'm sitting there thinking, I feel, oh, shame, you know, yes, we have more work to, to, to do there, um, but my team are, plank are planking in the middle of the office at some point in the day, you know, and they're tweeting that they're all getting fit, and they're out running and, and, and cycling, so that's, that's really good, but we could do more. Yeah. Yeah. Sleep's really important. <laughs> yes, <laughs> now, personally, I, yeah, absolutely, Don't I pay do enough more attention that. to sleep. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a tiny bit to add as well um, in relation to the, the work that we're doing that I mentioned earlier. Um, being able to talk to other colleagues and other organisations that do similar work um, is really beneficial. And um, we had um, some training from Dementia Adventure who kindly offered to be our sort of sounding um, post, you know, if we needed to discuss any issues that we were having with the project. and. Um, I think, yeah, talking to other colleagues and, and peers about about your work and about the stress levels that, that you might have is really useful too. I've got a long list of people uh, to come to. One thing I would very briefly say from, from here is that one of the sectors of society that has immense access to green space but suffers enormously from mental health issues, very high suicide rates, the farming community. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of access to green space. What they don't Isolation. often have is access to community <coughs> and yeah. coming together, which is why we put, when we had it, SDF money into a cafe at the auction that my colleague Simon helped to make happen. Because that was the only place these people could come together. So you know, community is enormously important in this. Uh, next on my list is Paul. Paul, if this is an auction, you bought something unless you want to speak. <laughs> I saw your hand. Yeah, okay. Um, Paul Hampton from Ash Park, England. Uh, really good conference and um, appreciated uh, all the speeches this morning. So um, I just wanted to, to say uh, it seems that there's a huge amount of ambition in this room, some really good projects going on. If there's only one thing that you could do, what would it be in order for us to move from individual projects to large-scale, ongoing programmes? Um, one thing to say, really, partnerships, I think, mm. is um, been really exciting today, chatting to people from other um, organisations and walking away with some business cards in, in my pocket, which is fantastic. Um, uh, I think that... Um, small isolated projects as pilots and um, you know it's it, it's exciting but it's even more exciting to think that we can work together regardless of, of which um, you know what your locality is um, yeah anybody else is one thing collaborate mm -hmm. collaborate and talk I'll take a sneaky two um, <laughs> absolutely I think I think that I, I seriously do not believe that one organisation or one individual is going to have the strength on their own to move things forward, and frankly, why should they? Well-being is a collective thing as much an individual thing, and I, I strongly believe that forums that are created, such as through the AOMB, and again, obviously, in national parks, absolutely fundamental. Uh, yes, yeah, I'd echo, echo definitely the collaboration point. And um, so, as I as I mentioned to you, Paul, I'm speaking at a conference on Monday when I'm pretty much going to give exactly the same speech to a slightly different audience. And it's frustrating that, that 
you know, that, that there isn't that collaboration. So I would just push um, for England's outdoor for all working group. I would suggest that you know those of you that are interested, there's a lot of um, great energy behind that group, and, and do do get involved because I think that's a, a great way for us all to come together. I would plump for education, particularly in the medical sphere, because I think um, there is evidence actually that people are trained out of using their natural instincts um, in the course of their medical training uh, or nursing training. So uh, we need to sort of change the model in our thinking and change it in our training, or otherwise I think we just go on repeating what we've always done. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, Jane. Amber is racing across with the microphone. <laughs> Your most recent research, the slide that you showed where the governing bodies and the residents' perception is, how do we bridge that gap between perception and reality? Four. Oh, that one hit me between the eyes. I think that's really for more my immediate thought. How do you bridge the gap between perception and reality? I'm thinking psychology, and uh, that's that's unfortunately, fortunately, not my bag. In terms of practical reality, I think it goes back again to my response to Paul. Collaboration and talking with these communities and explaining. One of the things that was quite exciting about the groups that we had, we mixed them. So, for example, we had somebody very pro-environmental with that sort of agenda. We had somebody who was very pro-business, um, which was a, a slight dichotomy. We had a resident. We had So we brought a wide variety of people together. And what was fascinating, one comment, for example, was we hate, um, what was that? We hate the forest, which is just on the way down from Purbex. Um, we, th we think it's appalling. Somebody else said, no, we actually really quite like it. Um, it's very nice and quiet and peaceful. The difference was basically where the two residents sat, and they weren't aware that there was some green shield management going on to deflect the noise on either side of this particular petition. And another example of knowledge, going back to education, the oil refinery in the Purbex area didn't actually show up as any great non-tranquil space on our model. The reason wasn't that we hadn't included it, the reason was it was so well managed nobody could see or hear it. It was beautifully well managed. Now that is, I think, a tremendous um, accolade in itself to the, to the team at the AOMB for how well that's managed and the planners and the local planning authority for shielding that particular space. And it was quite interesting that once we shared the fact with the focus group participants, there's an oil refinery there, and they went, really? Mm -hmm. uh, that knowledge, I wouldn't say so much education, but just knowledge, um, imparting information, was a way of, I suppose in that case, bridging perception with reality that helped to manage communities' expectations, perhaps, to a degree, and also institutions' aspirations. Hope that helps. Caroline, you'd like to come Could I just add about the senses? I mean, I think perception is reality for people because yeah. if, if um, you have lived in a noisy environment, say London, mm. all your life, then you go, your nervous system has adapted to that mm. and it's actually tuned down your sound uh, perception. Yeah. So actually go to somewhere that to you would seem you know, quite noisy mm. and they find it tranquil. Um, so that's the reality for them. But actually there's a huge amount of effort going on in their brain mm. to maintain that level of tuning down. So it's exhausting and stressful. And, and we know that noise levels, for example, around Heathrow, cause more heart attacks and strokes. And we know we, there's a lot of evidence around the harm to health. The effort of, of keeping... So people might say, well, I'm fine with that. I've lived here all my life. I'm, I'm used to it. But actually it's harming them because they're having to make this effort all the time to sort of screen out the noise. Um, Very good. Very nice. Henry. 
Thank you. Um, Henry Oliver from the North West Expands A and B, thank you for your presentations, all different and all inspiring. Um, I wanted to connect something that you've been talking about in passing this morning with something I think Ruth Hall was talking about on that first day, which is about light and lighting, artificial lighting in particular, which is a tranquility issue that unites town and country as perhaps nothing else does. Um, I wondered, essentially, one of the things that's been talked about um, on Monday was the impact on human health of artificial light, the wrong kind of artificial light, the wrong direction of it, the wrong time, and so on. And I wonder whether there's anything going on that you can tell us about that Public Health England or anyone else is doing that we can engage with, or use to engage with, in terms of putting the message out about lighting and its harmful impacts when it's done badly on human health to our local authority partners in particular who we work with. We'd like uh, a little run at how we can help with the, the darkening of the night skies agenda. Um, I can talk a little bit about it. Um, I wish I could say there's a big body of people working on that in Public Health England, but I don't think there is. What I have seen, though, is um, hospital redesign projects. Um, someone mentioned noise in hospitals, and that is a big factor. Um, they, they are redesigning the hospital so that the sound effects are much less dramatic, and everybody shuts doors in a different way, and so on. They're designed to shut differently. And at the same time, they're changing the lighting um, to make it less harsh. and. Tony, for example, in an ITU where there's lighting on 24 hours a day for obvious reasons, they're having a different light at night, um, realizing that patients sleep better. That's good. It's good enough for the nurses to do their job, but um, not so bright as during the day, and so they've got, still got their circadian rhythms, which is very important for health. Um, so, so I'm a big fan of this agenda, but I haven't seen a lot of work on it, to be honest. And I'm looking out for more. I think it will come as we approach, uh, you know, as we develop sustainability more, because it is, it is very harmful, this light, 24 hour light stuff going on for sleep. And that's now a much bigger part of it. We realize it's much more important for health. I mean, just a simple statistic, uh, you're, you're three times as likely um, to have a, a, cold, a severe cold if you don't get your regular amount of sleep that you should have, which slightly varies for different individuals. Mm -hmm. A simple thing like that, which could make a big difference to the number of people ending up in hospitals if we all got enough sleep. Anybody else feel <laughs> something for that? I, I think in terms of. Can you have the microphone, please? Oh, yeah. I think in terms. I think in terms of dark skies, um, has been quite interesting. You probably all heard at the New Forest with the airport and with the tower at Southampton. They fought long and hard to try and get some effect on lighting that could be seen from the new forest and failed and they've tried on several occasions to do that that's the new forest national park and then south downs have recently as you know won the dark skies accolade which is marvelous um, interestingly from the tranquility project visual pollution hardly came up and, and remember that the whole method was actually not to try and influence what participants said to us it very rarely came up. I think if memory says right, it was something like 0.02%, which was quite surprising. Um, but that's all I can say on that for the time being. Um, Sue, this will round to you. It's wait, wait. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I was also going to say that the presentations were fantastic, sweet, and, and very affirming. Um, it made me think about um, the 25 years that I've been in the conservation sector, and I think for all that time, the conservation world has been saying the links between the natural environment and health are really strong, and the evidence is now incredibly compelling, and it's there. So I guess I was thinking, um, how do we go from such a strong evidence base and some fantastic examples, <coughs> and you've given some, some really great stories of, of projects and initiatives that have delivered. How do we go to um, 
to get millions of people, millions more people, to benefit from the natural environment. And I guess my challenge is that I think that that is going to take a huge transfer of resources from cure to prevention, and that requires the uh, NHS to to really radically think about the resources and how they're applied. I don't, I'm not sure how else we can engage millions of people more in the natural environment. Um, how do we persuade the NHS to do that? How do we make that case when we find it difficult locally to engage all our GP surgeons in this subject, even though the evidence is all there and the projects and examples are all there? So any advice on that would be really welcome. Again. <laughs> I'll hold it up. Um, well, my first thought on that, and it's a very, very good question, we could spend a long time discussing it, but my first thought was, we are in the process of developing the 25-year environment strategy. And one of the things is that um, I, I have said personally to Rory Stewart, and I'm sure others have said it, is we need that link-up of that strategy at government level with the Department of Health because it shouldn't stand alone strategy. It's not just about the natural environment, it's about the human interaction with the natural environment and the benefits and harms that come from that. Um, so I think that's the first thing. At the sort of government level, it needs to be strategically engaged. I mean, the NHS at senior level, at NHS England level, now get this. Okay, so, but that doesn't mean every nurse and every GP and every, every doctor, because what I was saying about the training is it's embedded in you throughout your career. You have to sort of untrain yourself to think in a different way. And I found with Dandelion Time, for example, my, my GP colleagues don't get it straight away. But once they've been there, or once they've had a child of theirs referred and they've seen the difference of the child, they get it. Um, so they're not thinking in the right way. So that's a huge agenda in itself. Um, but I, I think this journey is... You know, we're on the first few sort of stops on the train journey, but we've got a long way to go to get to the, the destination. I think it is happening. And as a colleague said, it needs much more collaboration, this type of meeting, many more of these with health. And the event I'm doing in Bristol, for example, is, is designed to do just that, to get more people aware of the benefits and how they can be translated in reality. So it's not just a theoretical thing, how in reality you can deliver health benefits through the natural environment. And that addresses the funding crisis in the NHS because it is an unsustainable model. So everyone knows we've got to change. Not everyone knows the how we're going to change or to what. And it's that is you've got to hold out an alternative vision um, which is you know, which is better, long, more long-term, beneficial to human health and beneficial to the natural environment, which we are in the process of wrecking. Um, and we have to remember that. You know, we've got to stop doing that as well as look after ourselves. Um, Anybody else got any thoughts on that? It's interesting that we're talking about something where we're going to have a big change. We don't quite know what to yet. That's very topical at the moment. Isn't it? Oh, well, <laughs> <that's>... <laughs> um, yeah, just, just very quickly, with, without sounding defeatist, I, I, I just don't think we will achieve that transformational change top down. Um, just because uh, uh, I, I think um, if we're going to achieve this, we're going to achieve this bottom up through through localism, mm -hmm. through um, you know the the, the 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 I guess the positive of the restructure of the NHS is that you know local CCGs have that have that much commissioning power to do that. But I think nationally, the public health budget continues will be cut in real terms at least 3.94% year on year between now and 2020. So we all agree that prevention is a good thing and yet the public health budget is, is going backwards. Um, so I would suggest that um, the, the report that I talked about it was exactly about addressing that question. The, the next report which will come out is around, I suppose, looking at that mechanism around social prescribing and, and trying to unpick that. But it's really the, the change we're going to achieve is is I, you know nationally we, we may create that uh, that space and that environment to have the conversation, but the actual change we'll achieve will be local in terms of um, you know I think commissioners and, and uh, local um, uh, funders of this service are inherently conservative 
with a small c. Um, they don't want to do things that are new, but ultimately will achieve this through, uh, you know, there are good examples going on, we've talked about it, we need, to, we need to promote those examples. We need to be going to our commissioners and saying, I'm not asking you something new here, I'm asking you to fund something that works in this environment, this environment. And that's how we'll achieve the change, because I think if we're, if we're waiting for the NHS to change nationally, we'll all be waiting quite a long time. <laughs> Anyone else? I think, um, oh sorry, no, no. I think um, in terms of funds, there are lots of funds available and it's often one thing that's taught me at this grand old age of 53 is when everybody's watching and diverting their attention to other things, i.e. politically, that's the time to try and access increased funds, there's less competition. <laughs> Believe me, I will be working very hard the next three months. Um, and a lot of the funds that certainly we've been exposed to in the last five years are all about community bottom-up, localism, extending. I would say the biggest problem is how to include the hard to reach that aren't classified as disabled or mentally ill. In other words, the people that on the outside would seem quite normal, they don't want to get involved in groups, they don't, you know, perhaps they're widow recently widowed, um, they're looking to disengage themselves. How do you reach out to many hundreds of thousands of those we see them in Dorset particularly all the time that particular sector of the population concerns me there's definitely funds there and I think that's a good way of looking at um, I, I touched on earlier the, the health by stealth thing which um, which uh, one of the carers mentioned felt was quite relevant to our project and I think um, the on a very small grassroots level, uh, getting communities interested in, in your landscape or your AOMB or area um, can just start with it being inclusive or, or fun and engaging and the Y Valley AOMB recently um, did their second river festival with funding from the Arts Council um, and I actually visited by attending the last night of the River Festival, an area that was local to me that I didn't know existed, that was really beautiful, and have since been back and, and walked my dog there. So I think sometimes it's just that promotion and again, working with other people and making things sugar in the pill maybe, and maybe not hoping that people will do something just to benefit their health. Um, hoping that they might get more engaged with that once they realize what is out there and, and how enjoyable it can actually be. Yeah, I'd just like to add to that and say that the, the, um, the, the, the health by stealth is brilliant and we do arts by stealth as well, so arts and health by stealth. But, but it, is, it is about, challenge, for us, it's about challenging ourselves as well. Who do we work with? Who are we not working with, actually? Who are those people that we could work with, you know, uh, the, 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 that are in those communities that we're not already uh, with so so constantly thinking again you know uh, partnership always about the partnership but but always keep asking ourselves are, are we you know is there something we could be doing slightly differently I know they're sort of asking the same it's the same question but you know it's it's um, how are we communicating with people what's the language that we're using you know for us in the arts there is a, there's a lot of work in in some areas where the, you know, people don't understand what it it is. So we try and work hard to go. Okay, you have to access people through 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 you know language that that, that, that we all use. You know, and so that people feel comfortable. So so it's just I think we all need to challenge ourselves as well. Um, yeah. We've been told we have a little That's extra time. So does anybody else have a, a burning question or even a lightly smouldering one? <laughs> okay. How? Not so much question. I'll wait for my. Thank you. And um, in view of the fact we've got a few more minutes, I, I want to present a challenge. Um, <laughs> which is not so bad. The three of you on the left are already up to speed with the challenge, even if you don't know it. Um, we talk about isolation, and actually, organisations working in isolation is a difficult thing. We talk about collaboration, and we all go away from here, and we all do our own thing. You know, we may improve our collaborative techniques while we're here, but we may well go away and do different things. Now, we've committed as a national organisation to going away from here and working with Kate on a particular project. 
Um, we, we're doing work with tranquility, so we know that um, we, we're working collaboratively there. We're also very keen to continue the mindscape work that is going on in the, in the wide valley. So we're already working and going to go away and, and work with three of you. What I'm hoping is that following this conversation, um, we can maybe attend the event that you're talking about in a, in a very proactive way. That's one form. But commit to the, the whole of us agreeing to a couple of steps of action that are really positive, that we can report back, that will allow us to take us along that extra step. So um, it's about collaboration. It's a bit of a challenge. Some of you are already up there. Are you, are you up for that challenge? <laughs> oh, um, um, I can't really say no. <laughs> 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 um, no, 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 it's a absolutely. Um, I think uh, I would. I can see that collaboration on, on two levels. I suppose one is is so. So as I said. Uh, Mind is a federated organisation. We are. I work for a national organisation, but we are a network crossing it in the Wales of 140 local organisations. So there's an obvious um, uh, linkages to be made through uh, organisations that are in the same areas as, as your areas of outstanding beauty. And then I think nationally, it's through uh, things like the Albums for Working Group. It's through you know that we we have a role to play as. The, the National Association for Mental Health in um, talking very clearly about why people's mental health in, in these environments is important, but we want that to come from the green sector as much as it comes from us because it's implicit that we would say that. Um, so you know, we 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 worked with uh, organise we're working with organisations like the Land Trust and the National Trust and you know and TCB and the conservation volunteers to to mirror those same messages because I think that's where we collaborate. We talk about the same things, we measure the same things, and then we collaborate on those projects. So yeah, absolutely we're keen to collaborate. Um, yes, definitely. No, no equivocation there. Um, I just think two things occurred to me that are quite important about this because somebody mentioned the wider conversation with the millions of people out there who, who are not in organisations like we've got here today. Um, and so I think networking, formal networking opportunities, and, and I run a network on health and sustainability for the South region, so anybody here is welcome to join that. So there are opportunities then, we have masterclasses twice a year, we have a conference and, and newsletters and so on. So there's there's opportunity to exchange ideas and show where things are working and how they've overcome those local barriers to get funding, etc. Um, and secondly, social media, which is a mixed blessing, I know, um, but it is a good, really good way. And I know people have been tweeting here today, but I think we ought to get much better at getting key messages out to the wider public and linking. And it's a very good way of linking up with other constituencies. Um, so, who, who, who perhaps got more oomph, if you like, in, in changing uh, the political landscape and the financial landscape. So, I, I think if we should collaborate a lot more, but we should be smart in using, because we, we all don't want to work these long hours that are bad for us and sit at our desk too long, and uh, we would probably get our sleep and our exercise. So, we've got to do it in a way that isn't time intensive, um, and that's smartly. I'm going to bring this to a close. I'll try and summarise what, what was said uh, so we don't take away from this. Um, we need to collaborate smartly. <laughs> and um, we've got some new commitments for collaboration. I thought both presentations uh, that you just talked about there were, were absolutely fantastic, by the way, so there's a lot to, to lean on. Um, bringing new partners and new funders together, being innovative about how we do that. We need to educate ourselves about what kinds of projects we can develop, about where the evidence is, about where our partners are, and to educate those with whom we would work. I was very interested in the idea that practitioners in healthcare can sort of have, have trained out of them the notion that you might want to engage in the natural world for, for cures. Uh, we need to innovate, and we're seeing lots of innovation, through, especially through fantastic work that's happening in the southwest. Everything seems to be around uh, Tom at the moment, wherever Tom is doing the sorts of things in Dorset. 
but also great stuff in the Y Valley. Um, so we need to innovate in arts and crafts and culture and science. And I was very taken with what you said about um, talking not often being a way through some of this stuff, but doing, particularly you know, in terms of mental health and communicating with, with uh, hard to reach children sometimes. Um, where do we have go from evidence to action? Well, linking the 25-year strategy for the environment to strategies for the Department of Health seems like a bit of a, a no-brainer, really, and that's something that uh, we can amplify uh, from this meeting, but also to communicate, and the change that's needed from building on what Gavin said, is likely to have to come from the local level, from the bottom up. And there are lots and lots of things starting to happen at the local level. How can we better communicate the evidence from those and the success from those and start to build success from the bottom up? And finally, uh, physician, heal thyself. <laughs> so, um, in relation to us and our work, uh, we have to start getting this kind of stuff right too. When you were talking about emails coming out at all times of the night, I looked at my colleague up there and he was going... <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, physician heal thyself. Can we thank our panel in the usual way? <laughs>